Well, our, uh, our church business, this is what we're going to talk about today uh, in our spheres of influence, this is why we've talked about career two weeks ago, community last week, and the, the last thing we're going to do is spheres of influence in our church. And a church has a business, so to speak, and that biz- we're in the people business. And our business has to do with, with people who uh, have really no interest in God or, or, or some that have a, a lot of interest in God but are lost and helping them to find Jesus as their Savior and Lord and grow in discipleship and maturity and eventually to the part where they are doing things like what Michelle did, baking bread for other people, not just her and her family. Um, <clears throat> the ways that that happens generally are the Word of God or the Bible is shared with somebody and they, 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 they listen to this, and the, the, the element of truth res, begins to resonate in their heart. But part of what God does is he uses people. He uses garden variety people like us to come alongside and connect with people in the ways that she, Michelle, has done through simply walking, praying, and taking uh, uh, some bread over there. Connection. When you think of church, most of the time in America, people think of a building. I think a Pacific church or it's Seth's church. I go to Seth's church, that kind of thing. But a church is really not a collection of individuals who happen to come to the same place. From the New Testament point of view, church is a corporate entity. We are identified not just as God's son or daughter in his family, that's true, but we are also identified as corporately, as a family. As, as a group. And there are several different images of this, and, but they all have one thing in common, and that is the element of connection. Connection. First metaphor is uh, we are his flock. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Now, we are in one sense sheep, but we are not isolated sheep. We are a part of a flock or a herd, as he says here in Acts 20. The second metaphor is God's family, Ephesians 2.19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, also members of his household. And our church, this is our third B, belonging. We belong to God and we belong to, to one another. We are not just individual Christians, me and Jesus. There's, a, there's a, a broader identity to us. The third connection is the bride of Christ. At the end of time, as we know it, uh, John is, is, sees the future in Romans uh, 19, Revelation 19.7 says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Now, the Lamb is a metaphor for Jesus and, and it's the, the, the sacrificial death on a cross. But now the metaphor goes beyond to a groom. And his bride is all Christians who are living currently and have lived in the past and all of God's followers through history make up the bride. In other words, here, there's a corporate entity, a corporate identity uh, that he's talking about here as the bride of Christ. And the fourth connection, we belong to one another. Romans 12, 5 says, So in Christ, we though many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. In other words, the New Testament knows very little about the isolated Christian. That's, that's sort of an anomaly. It, it sees us as a corporate entity uh, in these different elements. Well, uh, it, more specifically, the church has some other metaphors to it, and that is an organism, a body, 1 Corinthians 12, 27. You are the body of Christ, speaking to the, the Christians at the Corinthian church. Each one of you is a part of it. Now, you, you know me as Seth, an entity. You don't know me as Seth the leg or, or Seth the thumb. You might know me as Seth the injured shoulder, hoping to, to get better. <laughs> But, but nobody comes up and says, high shoulder, we're praying for you. Uh, we are the body of Christ, has several different metaphors, and one of them is we, we put Jesus on display. Jesus is invisible to, to people and to us, but we are, as C.S. Lewis calls, little Christs. We are in process, and we, we replicate him. We are his hands to people. 
We are his feet when we move towards people, like to go walking or to go over to patio and ring a, ring a doorbell with bread. Uh, we are his arms that hug. We are a smile of delight when we see somebody, something replicating something of the wondrous grace of God that welcomes people like us. All of these things are part of the, the body of Christ. And then notice carefully, he says at the end of this verse, each one of you is a part of it. Now, this is an astounding statement to me. The Corinthian church was known as kind of the most pagan cities uh, in the, in the Greco-Western uh, world. And a church was born there. It's kind of like, oh my gosh, how could that have happened? And even in that church, with mostly made up of brand new Christians, Paul says, each one, each one. Nobody had a chance to say, well, I don't know if I qualify. I don't know if I have anything to offer. Each one is a part of it. Uh, we are part of an organism, relational organism. And that's where this is more specific. The church is a relational organism. When Paul wrote to the Roman church, he had 11 chapters of, of heavy theology. And then in chapter 12, he turns the page and he says, this is what it means for us in community. Uh, Romans 12, 9, love must be sincere. He's talking about relationships in the church. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. It's a relational organism. Never be lacking in zeal, keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Now, practice hospitality is what I've encouraged and challenged all of us to do this year. Once a month, do something with some other people outside uh, of uh, the, the people that come to church. And you can include some people in the church. That's a good idea. But, but something, practice hospitality. Now, what, what's the, the image in, our, in Western uh, culture so often of the church is sort of like going to the movies. You, you're going to go on to the movie on Saturday night. You park your car. You walk up. You buy your ticket. You're going to go over and buy your popcorn. You're going to go in. And, and you're not really interested in talking to anybody. Maybe just the people you went with. And you sit down, you wait for the movie, you watch the movie, and when it's done, you walk out without talking to anybody, and, and you get in the car, and, well, what did you guys think of the movie? Well, how'd you like the movie? And in, in America, in particularly, it's very easy for, for that metaphor to be how we think about church. But, but, but this, is not, this is not the metaphor of church at all. It's, this is not a place where you park your car, you come in, you, you, get, you buy your ticket, which for us is a name tag. You get your bulletin. You get your popcorn. You get your donut, and you get your coffee. You come in and sit down and hardly talk to anybody, and when the show is over, you get up, and you go back to the car as quickly as possible, and you ask, well, wh what was in it for me? What, what did I get out of this? Uh, this is not the movies. We are putting Christ on display. One historian of the early church was trying to figure out what this new branch of Christianity was and these new Christians. And he's trying to put words to describe them. But the one that struck him the most was this simple one. They are people who love one another. It was an astounding statement by, by this uh, historian. Uh, we make an impact by our relationships to one another. That happens inside the church building. It happens outside the church building. It happens during the week when you're with other people in our church and when you're with lost people. Part of the reason you make an impact in, this, in the spheres of influence is relationally. The church is also an organization. 1 Corinthians 12, 14 says, even so the body is not made up of one part but of many. And here he's talking about is that the body uh, works together, sort of symbiotically together. The, the parts that you see work together. The parts that you don't see work together. But, but, but everything has a function to it, and everything is working together. It's not just that we are relationally connected, but we are also organizationally connected. We serve together. We work together. 
1 Corinthians 12, 15. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not be for that reason stop being part of the body. Now, it's easy for all of us at different points of our life to think that. And the, one of the reasons we think that is because we naturally uh, live by comparative value. We look at somebody else that seems to have more value than us, and we just sort of dismiss ourselves. I guess I don't have anything to do. Uh, this sort of reminds me of a, 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 the second Super Bowl that... Uh, uh, not really happened, but on Super Bowl Sunday, there was a Super Bowl between the large animals and the small animals. And the large animals dominated the first half. And when the small animals went in for halftime, the coach was trying to, to give them a pep talk and, and, and gave them the best he could. And they went out for the second half of the game, and the big animals received the kickoff. On the first play, the elephant was stopped at the line of scrimmage. On the second play, the rhinoceros was also stopped at the line of scrimmage. And on the third play, the hippopotamus was sacked for a five-yard loss. And everybody was stunned. And the defense went off the field, and the defensive coach was beside himself with glee. And he, and he said, who took down the elephant? And the little centipede said, well, I did that. And he said, well, who took down the, the rhinoceros? And the centipede said, well, actually, I did that too. And he said, well, who sacked the, the hippopotamus for a five-yard loss? And the, the, the centipede said, well, I did that too. And the coach said, well, where were you in the first half? And the centipede replied, I was busy taping up my ankles. <laughs> there is a lesson for all of us with the centipede. Just because you look small to yourself and because you may look small to others, mean, to others does not mean you don't have a place to play. Verse, uh, verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? And here, Paul just kind of goes for the, the theater of the absurd. He paints this picture of one giant eyeball. Cyclops, even bigger than Cyclops. And it, it, it's just absurd. Where would the... Hearing be. If the whole body were an ear, use your imagination for a few seconds with that one. People walk in and we're all an ear. Where would the sense of smell be? Verse 18. In fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. So this is, this is more than just where do I want to serve? And the question is, well, where does God want me to serve? And how does God want me to serve? God is arranging us sort of like chess pieces on a board. He has a mission for us, a purpose for us. And it's in, in a lot of cases, using whatever gifts or talents, like baking, to make a difference with people. We make an impact, secondly, by pulling the wagon. The first way we make an impact is relationally, the way we relate to people, the attitudes that we have, the, to honor them, to be devoted to other people, to serve other people, but also by serving, pulling the wagon being involved organizationally in what the church is doing, whether it's inside the walls or outside the walls, either one is important. The thing that's most, incur that's most sort, of, sort of always grabs my attention is on the back of your handout, and that is how Paul talked about some of the people that he had served with in ministry. And, and the, there, the element here that I think of is there's over the course of our time in church life, what should happen is a sense of increasing engagement. Increasing engagement over time. Some of that's relational, and some of that is service and, uh, and, and uh, working together. Like, for example, Philemon 1.1, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, meaning he was writing from a Roman prison, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker. It's a metaphor, fellow worker. Well, what's a fellow worker? Did that mean he was on a church staff somewhere? He's paid. No, he was not paid. He was not on a church staff. He was a garden variety Christian. So what is Paul saying to Philemon in this letter? He's saying your care 
and concern and service for other people is not just ordinary. But I consider you a co-worker in what I'm doing. In other words, something of a higher commitment, a higher concern, more of an all-in here, fellow worker. Philippians 1 starts off similarly. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers. Overseer can also mean elder. Uh, and deacons. Now, these are not usually paid uh, professionals either. These are garden variety people who have stepped up their game with increased engagement, both relationally and organizationally, to move the church, the kingdom of God, forward. They have roles. They've, they've committed themselves to these roles and being faithful to those roles. Philippians 2.25 says, I think it necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus. And then notice the different metaphors he uses for Epaphroditus. My brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger whom you sent to take care of my needs. Again, now here is the highest compliment that he's saying to, about Epaphroditus. This is the highest engagement, the highest commitment. He's willing not just to do what he wants to do, what God wants to do, but what the church wants him to do. They sent him. He was deployable as a fellow soldier whom you sent. And Philemon 1, 2, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Now, my mentor in Texas, Harold Bullock, has described uh, in a, in a, in a week-long seminar sort of the stages that generally people go through from the first moment they step on a church campus through this progression of what God is trying to do in our lives of increasing engagement. The first one he describes as customers. People walk in to a church, our church, any church, as a customer, much like the same way you would walk into a restaurant the first time. You sit down at the restaurant, you look at the menu, somebody comes to wait on you, you order your drinks, you order your food, you eat your food. When you get done, you're walking out, and the question is all about you. How was the food? How was the ambience? How was the price? How was the waiter? What Was the food cooked the way it should have been? Uh, was the park? All of these questions are customer questions. Nobody really goes to a restaurant to think, how can I be a blessing to the person who's going to wait at my table? Or if there's somebody who's a host or a hostess, how can I be a blessing to them? Nobody thinks about, generally, tipping the cook. We're a customer. That is sort of how we think. That's the, the beginning level of engagement in a church. The second is consumer. At some point, if you go back to the same church a second time, that church has sort of passed the blind date test. Kind of like when you're in college. You had the blind date. You didn't know if you are going to have a second date. At some point, you think, I think I'll ask her out again. Uh, that's, sometimes that's how it is a church. Or you're still sort of checking the church out. But now, it's more of as a consumer rather than a customer. A consumer. In other words, still, what about me, and what am I going to get out of it? What does the church have for me? And there are three different kinds of consumers that Harold has identified. The first is disconnected consumers, meaning there are some people that come here, and they really don't want to meet anybody. They, they kind of wish we didn't have name tags. They, they just wish we could come in here and sit down, and nobody would talk to them, and they just want to leave. They're, they're checking out the gospel. They're checking out the church. They're checking out the pastor, the music. Are there people here like me? Uh, for some people, that's sort of that next stage. I want to come back. I want to check it out, but I'm not really sure how engaged I want to be uh, relationally. Disconnected consumers. At some point, though, if, if the, the blind date test continues and, and they're sort of like, well, now I'd, I'd sort of like to go steady here, um, then we become connected consumers, meaning they start to, are interested in starting to get to know a few people, usually people like them, same life stage that they have. They become connected consumers, but they're still sort of checking out the church and they're still sort of walking the door as a consumer. What am I going to get out of this? The third is contributing consumers. And by contributing, I don't mean just financially, but what can I do here? I, I want to help pull the wagon. 
but it is still generally as a consumer. I'll do what I want to do. I'll, do, I'll, I'll serve if it makes me happy, if it's fulfilling to me on my terms, when it's convenient. That's how we think as consumers. <clears throat> the next level of engagement is co-laborers. And that's what Paul mentions, or co-workers here. And at this point, the people come to the place where they want, I, I, this, this is now my church. It's not just Seth's church, or it's not just PCI, but this is my church. And, and, it's, and you sort of look at church life the way that you would if you were on a football team. Now, I'm part of the team. I show up for practice. I, I listen to the coach. I learn what my assignments are. I, li I, I listen to the other coaches, uh, and I'm learning how to play the game, the football game, with this particular team. At this point, a co-laborer is now more motivated by what is best for the church than what's best for me. The consumer thing slowly fades, and there's something that has a higher value to it. What can I do to, to add value here to this particular church that is my church? In other words, this person is now thinking about advancing the kingdom of God through the people in our church, including them. Relationally, through our attitudes, the way we serve and relate, and the way we serve. The fourth one is what he calls commando, uh, and I like that because all four of these start with the letter C. I'm a Baptist pastor, that's what we do. Um, but this is the fellow soldier, uh, the, the fellow soldier, the commando. And the commando is known by all in. I am all in. I am not living for trinkets or treasure or trivia. Been there, done that. I want my life to make a difference. And I'm ready to use the resources that God has given me of my time, my talents, and my treasures to advance God's kingdom through this particular body of people called Pacific Church. Um, the, I want to be a part of the solution. I don't want to be the person that's a part of the problem. And here, we make an impact by committed giving of ourselves. Committed, meaning a higher level, like, uh, like somebody uh, going overseas as a soldier, and giving, more than just giving, as, as 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7, we don't just give financially, we give of ourselves. Our time, our talent, we're investing who we are in the, in the ministry of the church. Now, these particular four things, I think, are really sort of like, wow. This engagement process, increasing engagement. And here, what I think about is, where are any of you or me in this process? In other words, I can see God with his hand on each one of us and wanting to move us from this point to the next point of engagement. And the next point, and the next point. People rarely jump from one to the other. But the thing that's intriguing to me today is what is your next increased engagement. If Jesus were sitting next to you, what would he tell you here? Increasing engagement. Now, when I think about this, I also think about things like uh, how, how he's developing me. Like, for example, uh, when, when we first came here, uh, what were my concerns? Uh, my concerns as a brand new person in the church are about me, or as we used to say in Texas, me and my. Me and my family, me and my money, me and my career, me and my job. But then at some point, we begin to become more interested in others. And the me begins to fade a little bit, and the others starts to grow. And then at some point, the others goes down a little bit, and you think about us. Us as a corporate entity as a church and what's best for us. And at some point, even that goes down and what finally comes up is the mission, our business in the people development business. So concerns, increasing engagement of concern or service. Uh, oftentimes you first go to a church, uh, I'll do something, I'll do a one-time thing. I'll help with set up or tear down after an event that I'm already going to or I'm already there. Yeah, that's kind of step one. And at some point, you begin to think, well, well, maybe I'll help if I'm asked. 
Or we might think, I'll help, but, but I want to do the least amount possible. Or what, what, it has to be convenient to my schedule. But at some point you think about, I want to serve regularly. I want to help pull the wagon. At some point people say, Seth, what's the hardest thing to get done here at church? I think I might want to sign up for that. What's well, hard to get people here? This is the process of increasing engagement of serving uh, or focus. Me and my, to others. How can I be a part of helping other people? How can I be of helping the church? And the last one is sacrifice. When I think about this, I think about that oftentimes in our in the church world, uh, we, we are so disconnected from this message that for the most part, we still have that customer-consumer mentality that, that, that oversees the other ones. I'm reminded of the story, and we'll finish with this, of, of two camels, a mother camel and, a, and a, her little son camel. And the son had some uh, questions for mother. He said, Mother, why do we have such big feet? And why are our feet three-toed feet? And she said, well, son, we are designed this way to be able to, to, to trek through the Sahara Desert over the hot sand without sinking in. And the son was curious about the answer to this. And he said, okay. Well, why do we have long eyelashes? And mother said, well, that's, again, we were designed to... To, to carry great loads across the Sahara Desert. And sometimes the wind is awful, and the wind will, will blow sand in our faces, and it allows us to keep the sand out of our eyes. And the son was a little more puzzled after the second answer. And then he said, well, why do we have a big hump on our back? And she said, well, because we were designed for the Sahara Desert, and there are not many oases there, and we are designed to be able to take Heavy burdens of people or equipment, baggage across long distances without having to have an oasis nearby. And now he was most puzzled of all, all three of those answers. And he said, Mother, he said, I really don't understand this. What are we doing in the San Diego Zoo? <laughs> Now, when I heard this story, I thought about modern Christianity. In church life, it's easy to focus as if this is the San Diego Zoo. And what's important is really just sort of, what's, what's my day going to be like today? And I become sort of this nice thing that little children wave at, and I might nod my head. When we were designed for the Sahara Desert, for the mission, of carrying people and equipment long distances toward a desired outcome. This is closer to the metaphor of church. Let's pray together. Um, Father, you have built within us the longing for our lives to make a difference. But it doesn't just make a difference Singularly, we have to engage, as we've looked at, with the people at work and in our career and in our community and in our church. It happens through connection, relational connections, serving connections, committed connections. And as we finish this message, I, I ask you, or maybe, maybe you are thinking, I think, you know, Seth, I think I've lived as a customer when it comes to church all my life. And maybe the challenge for you is to, what's my next step? To become a customer. To visit a restaurant <coughs> regularly. To begin to be disconnected customer consumer connected maybe some of you are, feel like I think I'm in that uh, consumer what's in it for me is, is way too strong 
And maybe your next step is to, what, is, what, is, what would it mean to be a co-worker? Whether that's inside the church walls, outside the church walls, but helping to pull the wagon more than just relationally. And maybe for some of you, you think, well, I, I'm a co-worker and I've always been a co-worker. I'm glad I'm a co-worker. But maybe your challenge is, what would it be like to be a co-soldier? Co a fellow soldier in the kingdom of God. There is an increasing engagement process, an increasing commitment process, but there's also an increasing impact difference that happens as we engage with people and the work that God has entrusted to us. Father, wherever each of us are today, would you help us to see you at work in trying to advance the cause of Christ through your people as we respond to you and the opportunities you give us with people and service.